Yeah, we have uh, three more uh, chapters to look at in this uh, foundations, wherein the most uh, important of those uh, is uh, uh, some of the uh, case studies where uh, risk, because the companies were not able to manage their risk properly, they have gone into bankruptcy or uh, they had to shut down their business operations or they had to be bought over by someone else. So such kind of uh, disasters have occurred probably after 1990s. Most of the stories uh, that we are seeing are uh, the very recent ones. So some of them are in even in the early 2000s and uh, some of them being in the 90s where uh, the derivatives market probably has just started. And uh, because of uh, some things handled wrongly, the companies have lost out on their operations. So probably we need to understand those kind of uh, scenarios also. Uh, sometimes it may look uh, very small in the current juncture, but when the derivatives were <coughs> pretty much new, all these kind of speculation activities have uh, happened, which has resulted in... Uh, lot of disasters uh, for the companies even in some cases they have lost to the extent of 1.5 billion dollars so that is the size of loss which means uh, probably some derivative transactions if if used for a speculation purpose instead of a hedging purpose could result in such kind of damages also to the company's uh, financial uh, numbers so the first of that is uh, a case study of uh, Drisdale securities with chase manard See, probably if we look at uh, the case, it's a very simple scenario where uh, uh, the Drisdale Securities have actually borrowed some amount from Chase Manor, $300 million. But now, okay, borrowing a company, uh, 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 an investment uh, bank, our investment uh, company or a securities uh, company borrowing uh, 300 million is not a big deal. But the key things there are the worth of the company is only 20 million dollars. But Chase Manhattan has actually lent them 300 million dollars. So almost 15 times the size of the company itself was the amount of borrowing. That's one key aspect. Then, what we are also saying, what did they do with this 300 million? This 300 million, the, the Drisdale uh, government securities, they have invested in various bonds. They have taken the various positions in the bond. So, basically like they have gone into the, uh, some long positions or they have purchased some bonds. Their values, if they go up, probably they are gaining. But what has actually happened in reality was there was a decline in the value. So if there is a decline in the value, that $300 million started uh, losing more and more heavily. And because the company doesn't have a proper equity backing also, even if they lose by $20 million, even if the 300, and, uh, 300 million, if it becomes 280 million also, Probably the bank is forced into bank. I mean, the, the company will be forced into bankruptcy because the equity position will be almost zero by that time. So they are almost forced into bankruptcy. But the key thing is, it's not the Drisdale which had lost badly. It's the Chase Manhattan that has lost badly because in this deal, Chase has acted as the investment uh, banker. So along with advice, it has also acted as a broker in the entire transaction. So as a part of that uh, transaction, it has the responsibility for any payments that are due from Dresden. So Chase Manhattan had to write off all those losses and it has gone into big losses. But what are the key things? Okay, what is the fraud side of it? Okay, on one side, there was a market risk because there was a decline in the value of uh, the bonds, which has resulted in a loss. But apart from the, there is a big operations risk that was involved in the process. 
what was that operation risk the system that has been used to value the collateral was a flawed system so collateral was always valued without the accrued interest so probably when uh, the let's say we are talking about uh, uh, a bond right a, a zero coupon bond purchased at 600 maturity value 1000 now while taking collateral the value of that was taken as 1000 but not or from a from a buyer standpoint the value of the collateral was looked at as 600 only but the accrued interest during the period was not included as a part of the finding out the value of the collateral so the value of the cash position whatever was the loan that was granted versus the value of the collateral there was a huge gap between the two so because of that the collateral was very much insufficient for the chase so uh, and the system which has been used the formulas or the the model that has been used because there was a flaw in the way it has uh, valued the collateral and because of that completely misleading reports have come even in our uh, data related uh, quality issues which we discussed yesterday we said a wrong formula can result in wrong reporting wrong reporting could result in wrong decisions this is what exactly is the scenario they have used a wrong formula to value the collateral so though they have thought that they have taken the collateral it is as if they didn't have any kind of collateral so it more of more of unsecured kind of securities rather than calling them as secured ones because of uh, the insufficiency of the collateral so what is typically what has typically happened in the whole process even the thinking process was different chase thought that it was purely an advisor but as a part of the deal it was also mentioned that chase will be responsible for all the collecting all the payments due so if the payments are not collected chase has to write off all those things so that was there as a part of an agreement which chase was not aware of so because of all these things there was a huge loss and probably this was one of the oldest case studies of uh, the list of case studies which we are looking at so during that time itself this kind of uh, risk based lessons have come up wherein uh, the key lesson says use more accurate method while valuing your collaterals and uh, based on what loan you are typically thinking of giving and uh, come up with a proper risk control function set up limits right evaluate what is the worth of that company based on the worth of that company only give appropriate uh, loan never give more than the size of the company or much more than the size of the company kind of uh, loan all these things come out as a part of the lessons out of this uh, case study then we have uh, the next one called uh, kidder p body again this is a full fraud based uh, case study wherein what we see is a series of trades which are misreported how did the misreporting happen it's a very interesting thing the misreporting has happened with respect to the government bond securities the person who was in charge of the government bond trading desk the way what he had done is the spot market and forward market time value of money was ignored for the forward uh, pricing transactions so basically uh, we we had to use the forward price as s not into e par rt right so it was said that he has removed this e par rt part so even the forward price uh, as per the calculation see let's say it's, it's as simple as this let's say i have got into the spot market today the price of some commodity in the spot market is 100 bucks and in the forward market it is 105 bucks right this guy what uh, he start or the, the the system what they have used is it directly records the profit of five because it ignores the time value of money see probably when i am saying one year forward exchange rate or commodity or whatever it is spot market 100 
one year forward 105 which means after one year it has to actually even the spot price will approach the forward price after one year but what this system was doing was it directly computed that 5 as a profit no time value considered so that uh, uh, that difference was directly considered as a profit and now long term forwards will always be at a very high price because if you go with the formula of S0 into E per RT the same thing would have become probably 100 into some number so it could have even been available at 120 so buying at 100 today or 120 after 2 years may not be anywhere different so actually literally speaking the profit is 0 there but the system which these guys have used shows the profit as 20 without considering the time value of money and that was the biggest flaw so that's where he is saying that the company was showing an artificial profit of 300 million dollars 350 million dollars just by showing the difference between so they have entered into all forward contracts right one year maturity six months expiry all these kind of various long term forward contracts they have entered into and uh, whatever was the forward price minus the spot price instead of taking the present value of the forward price to compute the profit generally when in in fmp when we have uh, tried computing the the profit at a at a particular point value of the forward transaction or value of the future transaction the computations which we have used were find out the present value of the forward minus the spot or spot minus the present value of the forward but these guys they did not do the present value of the forward they directly took the forward price minus the spot price every time it will be profit only there is a very rare occurrence that there will be a loss in that transaction so all those are reported as uh, profits so be, and they did not consider the present value of the forward contract which has resulted in huge profits coming up and that too especially when you are increasing the size of the contract 